So welcome. My name is Laura, uh, and I'm at the Nicholas School of the Environment at Duke University. Welcome to tonight's information session on Duke's upcoming three-course sequence, the Unoccupied Aircraft Systems uh, UAS, or Drones, Operations and Applications in Environmental Science. Um, I will be hosting this webinar as well as my colleague Hannah Rogers from Duke Learning Innovation. And tonight we also have three of the course instructors to help instruct you how you can learn to become a scientist pilot through our program and some opportunities to get involved in several of our upcoming courses. So we have three presenters tonight and I'd like to introduce them briefly before handing the microphone over to them to start the present presenting our content. Um, I also want to share that we are recording tonight's session. So for those that can't make it tonight or would like to review it later, we are recording and we'll share out the webinar afterwards. So the first speaker that we have is Dr. David Johnston, our lead instructor of the program and associate professor of the practice of marine conservation and ecology here at the Nicholas School of Environment. He's also the director of the Marine Robotics and Remote Sensing Lab, and he'll talk to us for a few minutes about um, the overall context and reason for the course and how you can become a scientist pilot through the program. We also have with us Troy Walton, our lead instructor for the next upcoming course in the series. Troy is the remote sensing lead for Atalo UAS, our instructional partner who provides training and services to the commercial and governmental sectors. Thank you, Troy, for being here with us tonight. Um, and then finally, we'll hear from Dr. Justin Ridge, our lead for the other spring course in this series, the quantitative analysis of UAS data. Justin's a research scientist here at Duke and leads the Marine Robotics and Remote Sensing Labs coastal mapping research. So after the introductions from all three of our course instructors, we will have a question and answer period where you'll be able to post your questions um, to the Q&A and they'll go to the host and the panelists uh, who will then ask the questions of the instructors and they'll um, you know, be able to open it up to the floor to whatever questions you might have about the courses. So without further ado, I am going to hand it over to Dave um, to take us through the introduction. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. I'm just going to share my screen. I got a couple of quick slides that I want to share with people um, as I kind of kick things off. Um, so first and foremost, welcome everyone. It's really nice to see you online here with us. I'm pretty excited about um, this set of courses that we've been uh, developing and, and um, uh, hosting online. And, uh, and I wanna kind of sort of walk you through um, our thinking about this. And I think where our courses really provide a lot of value added for people who are interested in using this uh, technology in the environmental sciences. And so this picture I'm showing here, this cartoon is, is kind of like a deconstructed view of, of someone who might be using a drone to be able to study something in a coastal environment. So in this case, our drone pilot may be flying that multi-copter little drone there, it looks like a phantom in the middle. And and um, maybe we're interested in what's happening in the water, maybe an animal or a, or a, a boat, uh, or maybe we're interested in some of the actual, you know, physical habitat components, rocks or oysters or any number of things that might be um, accessible. And uh, and so th really this is what we're trying to do for, for our learners is, is to think about these particular kinds of missions, deconstruct them and get the, get you uh, as your as learners to think about uh, how do I collect robust scientific data uh, in a way that's going to allow me to answer the question that I have or or to to be able to push forward on the particular problem that I'm trying to solve, and and this is actually really different than a lot of sort of typical trainings where you're just focused on learning how to fly, um, and and I, and I think those are incredibly valuable, um, but the thing that those uh, courses don't provide you is the ability to take that to the next step and and move into a situation where you're flying legally and ethically and at the same time collecting really high quality data right and that's that's really what we want to do and that's that's our goal is to try and train uh, scientist pilots right people who can who can really think about this as it's more of a career option, something that will um, allow them to, you know, not just 
uh, fly, but but fly for a particular scientific purpose and and be successful uh, in that uh, endeavor. Um, and so I'm going to switch it up now and just talk a little bit about these three courses. We we specifically broke them down in a way that would allow people to sort of move through um, a lot of complex information um, in a in a sort of a, a way that that will make it accessible. So we split this course sequence into three different um, courses, one being an introductory course, a follow-up course that's focused on operations, and then you know the the roundup course, which really takes us into that. You know, now that I've been able to go out and collect data, how do I deal with it, right? Because that's that's where the most important parts are. Um, you know, drones are useful, they're interesting, but they're a platform. The uh, second most important thing, really, you know, or the more important thing is that sensor that's attached to it. But really, the key is being able to do the analysis. So, so in our introductory course. Basically, we're going to try and get you to the point where you'll be able to identify how drones are used in a variety of research contexts, including maybe what you want to do. In that second course, we're going to take you through that, you know, applying that information about um, how drones work and how they're applied um, and, and get you to a point where you'll be able to do that in, in, a, in a very robust way and become a scientist pilot and then follow that up with that roundup quantitative course where um, you'll be able to test some hypotheses, work on real research questions, and, uh, and, and sort of move into that next phase, which is where, where we want to get you as learners. Um, the journey will be fun. And one of the things that we've been really working on um, in our uh, you know, development of these courses is uh, gamification, right? So um, People, when they take courses, they don't necessarily like quizzes, those kinds of things. Sometimes that's not the highlight of, of uh, the, uh, the process. But assessments are important, right? We want to be able to make sure that you're learning and test whether or not you're picking these things up. So in our case, we worked really closely with uh, Learning Innovation. And thanks for Hannah uh, to Hannah for being here with us tonight. Um, but to, to essentially transform some of our assessments more into um, fun things to do games, um, active learning activities. Uh, in, in our case, we use a lot of um, sort of interesting kind of choose your own adventure type um, activities that allow you to explore particular um, applications, uh, research you know, projects, different applications that, um, that may occur in the real world and, and learn about the mistakes that can be made. Um, and it's way better to make those mistakes in the computer than it is when you're flying your your drone out in the um, in the real world, uh, and so um, so really look forward to that. We have a little we we use our our Discord server very um, intimately in this class. Uh, it's a place where we build a community where we um, share information um, and where we um, actually execute all of our assessments and everything. And that includes having a local economy within there that allows you to earn badges um, and even some real world stuff if you uh, if you really put your nose to the grindstone. So um, and the last thing that I want to say is that um, so we've we're, we've gone through the first course this year already. So we just finished up our introduction course. Um, but I wanted to let people know that we're um, we're also going to start a, a shorter course on Coursera in the new year that addresses some of these initial introductory things. Um, and uh, so make sure you keep your eyes peeled for that. We'll let people know. Um, but that's another opportunity to get into this course sequence and uh, uh, and start moving yourself down this sort of, um, you know, process to become a scientific pilot. So I'm going to pass it on to the two instructors now who are, are going to fill you in, uh, you know, with a lot more detail on what's in store. Um, but again, welcome. Thank you so much for your interest. And um, we're looking forward to seeing you, some of you, hopefully, um, in our courses sometime uh, in the near future. So I'm going to pass it on now. Thanks, Dave. Give me one second here. I will start sharing my screen. All right. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, so the second course in the series, um, for those of you that did take the first one, you'll be perfectly set up uh, in order to come in now. And even if you haven't, we can still pick it up because there is a little bit of review. You know, we've designed all three courses uh, to be mutually beneficial together. 
um, but you can take them standalone. And so the one that I'm going to talk about is operations for environmental scientists. So our outcomes here, um, everyone always asks is part 107. Uh, if you are not familiar with that, that is the Federal Aviation Administration's regulations. It is specific to the United States. Uh, and it is, if you want to go fly a drone and make money for it, then you have to be part 107 certified to fly legally to do that. Uh, so we will cover all of the intricacies that are, are needed uh, and associated with that. So airspace, weather, reading weather reports, uh, crew resource management, aeronautical decision-making, et cetera. All of that uh, information is built into the course. But as Dave said, um, you know, there's a lot of other courses online that you can take that cover that same information. But we like to take it to the next level here um, and to really build in and to help. And the term that Dave used be, to become the scientist pilot, um, I think is really what sets our course apart. Uh, and bridges the gap in between just knowing Part 107 regulations so you can go and take your test and be legal. We'd like to go a bit further. And, you know, it's, to be honest, it's really not that hard if you want to go out and fly a drone like this. Um, you takes a couple hours of on the sticks and you're fairly proficient. But you're not proficient at planning uh, an actual mission, a large collection, if you're mapping shoreline change and erosion on a beach or mapping a forest stand, uh, for example, there's a lot more details that funnel into that. And then knowing how to do that legally and make sure that you're not flying in controlled airspace, uh, which can get yourself in trouble. And that's gonna be even more prominent here pretty soon uh, when the FAA introduces uh, the remote ID rule and drones will have essentially a little transponder on them and you'll be able to be tracked a little bit easier. So knowing that you are safe and legal is even that much better for you. So we're going to cover permits. Uh, so the uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Endangered Species Act, you know, those are all things that scientists pilots need to be concerned about because a lot of times we're not just flying around a building and taking pictures of homes, which when I tell people I fly drones, they're like, oh, you do real estate. I'm like, no, I don't. Uh, that is not that hard, honestly. Again, you still have to go through all of the Protocol. So if that's what you want to do, and that's why you're here, you will certainly know how to do that with our Part 107 information. Uh, but we're going to keep going with that. And then really, when you start getting into data processing uh, with Justin's class, then it's even that more important to know that you have planned your mission. Because if you go out and fly a drone, and your data is not usable, then you know why did you really go out and do it? Besides practicing, that's great. Maybe that's what you want to do. Um, but efficiently and accurately collecting the best data uh, is what we're going to focus on. And that brings you to become the scientist pilot. So your instructors, you'll see um, videos, you'll watch weekly videos. Uh, it's a six week course, just like the first one was, and just like Justin's is for the um, data analysis. Uh, and each week is broken down to a different segment. So for example, uh, week one is airspace. And then um, I'll show you a little bit more about the topics we're going to cover here. For your instructors, just to kind of give us a quick background here, myself, uh, I was a Marine along with uh, Jimmy Birch and John Putney. We all work for Atalo now. And then uh, Mitch Monroe is our latest addition. He um, is retired Air Force, but we still let him come on. Uh, we like him a lot. He's very, very knowledgeable, ton of aviation experience among all four of us. Um, from various different sorts, John was a helicopter pilot. Jimmy and I flew drones. Um, I have my private pilot license as well. So, you know, we live in this world daily. Um, and Mitch is retired Air Force. Like I mentioned, he works with the South Carolina Civil Air Patrol. So we're very plugged into a lot of different networks in aviation. Um, we talk to the FAA, you know, we like to think that we are on the forefront of the unoccupied aircraft systems uh, frontier, if you will. And then lastly, um, you'll get to see Dave again. If you didn't see him in the first course, uh, he comes in, he's created this great series, which helps really tie it in. Uh, that's called Protocol Playbook. And that really ties in that science disc pilot um, portion of it. We'll mention it too in the videos and discussions that we have, but then it just really takes it to the next level. Dave has created um, a great little series in addition to us. So here, uh, to close out, we have our course topics. So uh, week one is airspace, week two is weather, then we get into special locations and permits, um, payloads, 
a lot of scientists want to put different payloads on drones. So you need to understand weight and balance, center of gravity, all those types of things. We'll introduce you to a few different types of flight software. You know, we're not trying to push one or the other onto you, um, but we're doing this really cool new addition this year where you get on a virtual machine. You'll be doing that in Justin's course, which he'll talk about more as well. Uh, but you actually get to plan a mission uh, via a flight software that we use um, quite frequently for one of our fixed wing mapping drones. Uh, and one of the course videos walks you through how to do all of this. And then finally, we close it out with aeronautical decision making, bringing it all together uh, of how to safely, efficiently collect scientific data. And that brings me perfectly to toss it over to Justin, who's going to talk about in course two, we have all of the flight portion collecting the data, but then you have to know what to do with it. So Justin can now tell you about data analysis. Thanks, Troy. All right, I'll jump in here. I'll start sharing. Okay, talking about course three, which is the UAS data analysis. Um, this is, so I'm the primary instructor. You will see some of Dave during course three though as well. Um, he's, he's always here. Uh, but we're gonna, with this course, um, we're gonna dive into the data. And so the building, the sort of the recap and build off of, of Troy's course is going to involve, let's see if I can get this moving, here we go, um, how we collect good data. So it's, it's kind of reinforcing that idea of like, what is good data? We're gonna talk about, um, you know, best practices for how we collect uh, our different types of data. Uh, and we're going to cover a lot of different uh, platforms and sensors when we do that. Uh, and it's really important just to reiterate, you know, when we're going to be moving into the analysis, we, we're talk about, you know, the confidence you have with the data you've collected. And so how you, how you ensure that what you get is the best you can make of it. Um, so as I said, we're going to talk about using a number of different um, sensors and platforms that might be collecting the data uh, and also thinking about that mission planning aspect of how you prepare to collect the data so that it is the best and what you the decisions you make in terms of setting sensor uh, sensor settings and um, your general operation during the mission uh, and how that data is collected. And so from there, as Troy mentioned, we're gonna get into working with a bunch of different types of data. And this is where you'll be using virtual machines um, to access all the software that you'll need to, to operate with. Um, and so you'll be working in a number of data labs that we run each week. And so we're actually, Last year, we did run a six-week course. This year, I think we'll actually be running a seven-week course just to give you a little bit more time to work with the data labs. Um, but those data labs are meant to like it give you experience working with uh, different types of data, different mission objectives. Um, and so maybe you're collecting stills of, of uh, whatever your target uh, uh, organism is, or you're doing mapping missions. You're collecting a series of images. So those data labs are set up to, to help you work with different types of data and get you your hands on um, a number of different processing workflows. Um, and so that'll all be set up to run and I'll be running um, office hours during the those weeks in order for us to, to kind of have an opportunity for if you're running into issues, we can um, convene and, and you can we can work together on getting everything sorted out. And this is just, you know, talking about the different types of data that we're going to be working with. So we're going to be working with um, your standard RGB imagery. We're going to be working with uh, multispectral data. Um, we're going to be working with looking at how you create 3D models from, um, from imagery and what you can do with those 3D models. Uh, and then we're also going to be talking about yeah, the, the multispectral different indices that you can use and how you can use those in classification, um, how you can extract uh, measurements for organisms uh, from stills that you've taken and how that all plays out based on the different platforms and the quality of images that you're collecting. Uh, and we'll also cover uh, some of the deep learning aspects that are coming out with, with how people are analyzing their data and automating that process. Uh, 
we'll get into that at the, the, the end of the course. And then finally, I want to say, you know, this is an opportunity for, we have the data labs, but also it, we want it to be a space where if you have data that you want to play with and we can talk about during the course, it's, it's not a good opportunity for you to utilize these VMs and the software that's available um, to, to test out maybe a data set that you wanted to, to go in and, and work on. So, and then we can um, talk about that during the course, during some of our live sessions or office hours. So, yeah. That um, pretty much sums up what course three is all about. Thank you so much, Justin, Troy, and Dave. Uh, Dave, did you wanna say any final words before we move into a question and answer period? Um, man, I think just, uh, you know, really, really, uh, great thanks to Troy and Justin for, um, for, you know, sort of breaking out what's, you know, part of the uh, um, of this course sequence, uh, and and I think you know, trying to there's a really great opportunity for us here to explain to you a little bit more about um, what you might need to know before you engage, um, what what kind of background information you might have. We're here to answer questions that might help you in your decision making process if you're really thinking about uh, taking this step. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, I would just say probably now is best time to maybe move in towards some questions and um, see uh, how, how we can facilitate some, some answers. Okay, great. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and um, spotlight Justin, Troy, and Dave. And uh, my colleague Hannah here has been combing through the questions and we'll go ahead and start posing questions to you all. Awesome, thanks. Um, I, I'm going to just group questions um, that are similar as they come in um, and read them off to our panel. So thanks everyone. Um, so uh, the first question is, what is the cost for this program, this three core sequence? Awesome. Well, I'm happy to jump in there. Um, we uh, at present, where the the cost for a, a single course is two thousand um, dollars U.S. and uh, but if you jump in and take all three, um, you get a pretty significant discount, and we sell the, the full sequence for forty two hundred dollars U.S. Um, and so uh, that's the that's our going rate for those. So you can sign up for individual courses or you can sign up for the sequence if you'd like. Um, and, uh, you know, there are um, currently we don't have any scholarships, um, but it's something that we're working on. Um, there may be some calls in the future uh, for people to apply to, to that might be able to facilitate uh, participation for people who might not necessarily have the funds to be able to, to participate. And, and just to follow up on that, Dave, so to be clear, like there are plans to teach this course sequence again in the future if people missed out on course one this time. Absolutely. So um, we uh, we start in the fall. Our first course starts in October and finishes up, um, you know, just before Thanksgiving. We take a break for holidays here in the U.S., um, start again in the new year uh, and uh, finish up in the spring. So it's uh, it's. It's a bit of an extended period of time, but um, we'll be teaching it again next, starting the whole sequence again next October. And to just sort of follow up on this discussion of time, um, you know, there, there are questions about like how long would all, you know, um, three courses take? Like what's the time commitment if someone commits to this course series? Um, so, yeah, so each course is five weeks long. We expect that on a weekly basis, it's probably six hours of investment, reading, watching videos, and working on some, you know, uh, some assessments. Um, except for the final course, and we've extended that a little bit just because um, the analytical parts take a little bit longer for folks. Um, we will, um, you know, sort of work things week by week, so material is released every week for people to work on. So there's some sequencing, and um, we also do live sessions every week as well to um, um, you know make sure that we're able to give you know you know you know useful feedback, uh, celebrate people's successes in their assessments, and um, and and generally make sure that we can get people through and and help them sort of build community, help them interact better with their peers, and and learn more. 
And another question has come in. So to clarify, um, will all the classes be virtual? Are there any sort of on-site or travel requirements? At the present, no. Right now, everything is virtual. Um, although if people are really interested, we'd always run, love to run a boot camp for people. So, you know, let's, if there's demand, we can do it. Um, and, and, you know, uh, someone else has asked, you know, what is the, you know, age requirements? Like, does a student have to be in college? Like, who are these courses appropriate for? Um, this person is actually saying that they're a middle school science teacher and some of their students would be super interested in, you know, a course about drones. Oh, what's an interesting question. I would say that for the most part, the, the, the second two courses, well, all three courses are probably targeted at someone at the college age. Um, some of the material in the first course is pretty accessible. Um, and, and so it may be possible to have advanced students, um, you know, participate in that, but, um, you know, maybe a better approach might be to, to connect, um, and, and talk a little bit more about what we might be able to do for that age group, because there's lots of opportunity and, um, and we, we would be able to, to teach to that level for sure. And, and if I might add, um, you know, the Coursera course might be more appropriate for people who like are on, on a beginner level. Of course, Coursera has its own age policies and I'm not a Coursera rep representative, so you should all check that out independently. Um, but if you're interested in the Coursera course and you want more information about it, um, you can sign up for our wait list and we will let you know whenever it launches in 2023. Um, we also had some questions about like, do you need a drone to participate in this course um, or any other kind of equipment requirements? We don't, you don't have to have a drone to do it, but you're gonna to wanna to get one as soon as you start taking the courses for sure. Yeah, I would say like what the only technological, like the only technology requirements we have is that you have a computer that can access the internet, uh, right? Because that's, or at least for the course three and now part of course two, the virtual machine part is is a just will require you to be able to be online and, and accessing and accessing the videos too. So it's that's that's really the only necessary tech stuff. And I would echo it's really important to try and get a computer as opposed to a tablet or a phone because of some of the tech requirements of the learning management system and that virtual machine. Um we also have some questions about, um, you know, like, is the cost of tuition billed at registration or when the course begins, if you want to sign up? Um, and are there any variations in costs for international students or is it the same for everyone? Um, so I, I, I'll, the, the course cost is the same for everyone unless we can figure out a, some type of scholarship. Um, so there's no variation um, internationally and, uh, and the, the costs are due when you register. And someone would like to know if there are still slots open for course three this spring. There are. Yes, there are. Um, definitely. I believe that. Yeah. Um, and, and like, um, this there's only like a handful left, like I believe, but yeah, there are some slots left. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I believe that we've mostly covered this, but I just want to make sure this person gets a clarification. Um, in addition to the co cost of the course, are, are there extra costs, um, like teaching materials, um, or textbooks? No, no, nope. uh, yeah, not, not for the intro course. No, no, uh, yeah, there's no extra materials for the course three. And I think Troy, what there's like an optional book that they could get if they yeah i have an optional um faa test supplement to help you if your goal is to take and pass the part 107 it has sample questions uh that are directly from the test so it's a good 20 dollars investment uh if you want to take the part 107. Some, someone has asked, why is registration closed for course one? And can I do course one after I've done courses two and three? Yeah, registration is closed for course one because we just finished it. 
um, but it's possible to do it afterward as well. So um, that's that's kind of the current state of, of the registration and the position that we're at time-wise in the course sequence. Uh, a couple of questions about course three and or software just generally. Um, could could you all say a few words about like what access students have to data collection software and if that costs any extra? Um, so the most the software that's provided during uh, course three, it's going to be mostly like the image processing software and and the post process like so so looking at like ArcGIS um, software is provided within the virtual machine. Um, so that's that's all housed. Everyone will be um, provided a virtual machine access, and you can it'll be your own personal virtual machine that you can work for, work on. Um, and you can download data that you want to work on. To, so you'll download the data for the data labs onto those virtual machines and work on all the software will be there for you to use um, to do the data labs. Or if you have data that you want to potentially like explore of your own, you can also download that onto the virtual machine and, and use the, the software we have on there to, to explore it while those are active. Um, yeah, and I'll say also, like, I don't think I mentioned it when I was giving the summary, but um, the design of course three is that you don't need, you know, there's no prerequisite for you to like understand how all this plays out. We've we've worked very hard and learning at Duke Learning Innovation, Hannah and others have diligently worked through the data labs to like make sure that they're very uh, accessible, I would, I would say, and hope. So um, don't be scared off by like worried about advanced um, software knowledge. It's actually funny that you bring up prerequisites, Justin, because uh, one of the questions in the chat is, what are the prerequisites that you need? I knew that was coming. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, you don't need the, yeah, we designed the course so that you're not, we don't expect you to come in like knowing how to do, like not even like how to work in Arc GIS or anything. Like we, we try to make that very clear for you in the data labs. Yeah, same with the other courses as well. They're really well set up for people. Um, and just, you know, to give you some perspective, we just finished our first course and a, a large portion of people who are, that took the first course are not environmental scientists. They come from a range of backgrounds. Um, some are technologists, some are, are just interested in, um, you know, how drones work um, and coming in with, uh, just open minds and excitement, um, you know, sort of cultivating that explorer mindset to, to be able to pick up new skills and understand new things. I'm, I'm going to combine quite a few questions um, since they, these are quite similar, but um, if someone doesn't have a part 107 or does have a part 107 or is someone who lives and works outside the US, what would you say to people of different experiences um, and like how that will impact um, their experience in the course? Uh, I'd say for course two, uh, if you already have a part 107, it all depends on your comfort level. Uh, to be completely honest, it's not that hard to cram for the test and like a week and a half, two weeks and go and take and pass it. Um, but then when you get out to the field, do you, do you have any idea of what you're doing? So if you're one of those people and you say no, then I would say you can gain a lot from uh, taking course two as well. Uh, for international students, week one is very specific to the United States uh, because we cover our airspace structure here in the US. But then further down in weeks four and five, I believe we start getting into a few international. Obviously, we can't um, discover every nation's different types of UAS structures for what they do for airspace. However, a lot of them, um, as we explored when we were creating this course, uh, have very similar structures 
uh, and drone regulations. Um, so I flew in Ecuador and the Galapagos over the summer and same thing, 400 feet altitude, you have to be able to see the drones. So a lot of the similarities and then we can't like fully dive into it and I'm no expert, I can't speak on whatever country you live in, but we can explore and, and the core structure is really designed nicely for this of where, um, you know, we can look at things together and if you have a specific question, you know, we can kind of go into it a little bit and that can help other people learning too. So we kind of build this community um, that we have and the Discord server allows that um, really nicely. And there may be somebody else in the Discord who's taken the course in the past um, that has flown in your location. They can help you and we can in turn all help each other. Uh, so we have another couple of questions that I'm going to combine, which is, um, could you all take us through like what the course looks like as a student in which you're like once you're in it? And by that, I mean, are the live sessions going to be recorded? Can you take the material anytime or is it on a weekly schedule? Um, that kind of thing. Yeah, the the live sessions are set for um, course two at least, and I'm pretty sure that's the same. So we'll do them every week at a certain time. So I think for course two, it's gonna be Thursdays at seven, if I'm not mistaken, don't hold me to that. Uh, but we're gonna do it whatever time it is every week and we will record it. So if you can't make it at that time, then you can go back and watch it, um, the live session. The live session takes material that we've covered in the videos that you can watch at any time that are already recorded and they're in um, Sakai and built in for you and ready to go. Uh, you watch those whenever you want and you can just do the same, but the live sessions build upon those and the live gives us a little bit of Q&A back and forth. Um, so if you have a question, you know, certainly coming to the live session and typing it in or asking over the virtual via cameras and whatnot um, is great and good interaction happens and occurs back and forth. And then for the course three, you add on to that if you're working on the data lab. So you'll actually be spending a chunk of a lot of your time, those six, you know, the six hours we're talking about the week that dive using your VM um, and then Aside from the live session, I'll also have a, a chunk of time set out for office hours that I'll just be, it'll be open. Anyone can join and jump into the Discord server and we can talk about whatever. Um, but there'll also be opportunities to, if you, if those office hours don't work for you, we could schedule something to, to chat. So, yeah. And and uh, Justin, a couple of questions about course three and what that looks like. Um, could you say more about what software uh, learners will use and like, will they be able to keep their visualizations that they create on their VMs? Yeah, well, you'll be able to, so the software packages that we are using in the course, let's see where we've got, um, we'll dive into, so we're primarily working with PIX4D uh, software uh, and then ArcGIS Pro, um, we'll get into some of like the single image analysis using uh, programs like Morphometrics um, and uh, ImageJ. I'm trying to remember what else we're going to be using. We're also going to be looking at like a deep learning programs using um, some interfaces like AIDE, which off the top of my head, I'm trying to remember exactly what it's like. <laughs> it's a it's a browser based um, deep learning uh, interface. And yeah, I'm trying to remember, I'm probably missing something. There's some other um, Python based stuff we might get into, but those are the big, um, those are the big ones that we, that we work with. And you will, you will be able to like, so the products that you create, whatever you do in your VM, you know, that's something that you can, if you want to save, you visualize your visualizations or your products. Um, you can definitely like, you know, export those out uh, to have to, to use later. And uh, especially if you are exploring your own data and you want to do something in there and, and save that, that's something. And the, the VMs, you know, we, we allow for a certain, even because sometimes it's hard for some people to, to, to finish everything within the, the six or seven weeks that we're, going to be running this. It's not like we just shut off your VM after that. Um, so you might, you'll likely have a little bit more time to, to get through it if you need it. Did I answer everything, Hannah? I believe so. Um, a, a 
a couple more specific questions. Um, I noticed many of the data visualizations are the surface uh, coaster land. Understanding there are remote sensors for atmospheric variables, will the course cover payloads that measure atmospheric variables such as temperature, humidity, winds, clouds, et cetera? Um, we're mostly focused on imagery based. And so we're, we're, and by that, like we're, we're looking at, um, we're not getting too much into like atmospheric sensors or, or anything like that. So yeah, we don't really, we don't touch too much into that. Um, we get so a little bit like dive into a little bit like variability of payloads. Um, but the data labs are all focused on, on the imagery based. Someone else asked, I've been mapping humpback whales in Hawaii, uh, geomorphic change along California coast, et cetera, but always as an undergrad technician. I have my part 107, fly fixed wings and multi-rotors, but I want to get more into data processing. It sounds like it might be best for me to jump into class three. That it sounds does. perfect. Yeah. It's, it would be magic. Yeah. And <laughs> Amazing. Um, so there, there are a lot of questions about, so like what, what kind of certification do you get after completing the course? Um, what does it look like for you after you complete the course? And in general, um, do any of you have any thoughts about, um, you know, a career in the environmental sciences, especially as a scientist pilot? Um, well, I can I can fill in at the end of the sequence. You'll get it. You'll at, at the end of each course. You'll get a certificate from Duke um, that states that you've um, you know completed the requirements for it, as well as a full sequence one as well. Um, and so that's provided. And um, and so you know we we increasingly understand that having these kinds of micro credentialing things are helpful, right, for people when they're navigating careers. And so, um, you know, one of our goals is to provide that for people so that, you know, being able to demonstrate that you've taken some training that's focused in the particular area that you're interested in and having that um, on your resume is a really valuable thing. And it might be the one thing that gets you to the interview, right? Maybe that's the one thing that gets you past everybody else when people are scanning CVs. Um, and so we're very sensitive to that and, and want to be able to help provide that for people as they, um, as they, you know, embark on this type of thing. There's a lot of careers in environmental science and I'll, I'll be honest with you, drones are, are being adopted and used in almost every aspect of the environmental sciences. It's not always necessarily for direct data collection. It might be for doing calibration or validation of things. It might be, you know, in an integrative ecology project where it's just one tool that's being applied, but you're going to find a hard time. You'll have a hard time trying to find environmental science programs that are not, that are not using this type of, of, you know, on-demand remote sensing. It's, it's a game changer. Um, and um, it's, it's always more about just being able to fly. It's being able to understand how the systems work, how to be able to recover from failures in the field, how to um, how to choose the right sensor for the particular mission that you want to do, and ultimately take advantage of that amazing data to answer the question. Um, and so, so it's really you know trying to get at those you know all of these foundational things that you would need to be able to support um, you know a move into this area uh, and and a possible job. You know, in the real world right now, my lab is trying to hire two people um, that are. Uh, a combination of a drone pilot and a and a research technician that's comfortable with geospatial stuff and remote sensing. So right now I'm hiring, trying to hire two people. Um, and so that should be an indication that there is definitely opportunity out there. And and I'll also add that if um you're exploring a different career path, the Coursera course is going to have a week that is thinking specifically about like how you can get involved in the drones community and like what career options are out there. Um, speaking of career options, someone is asking, are these courses relevant to wildlife filmmaking or is it more research oriented? I'll jump in a little bit on that one and, and say, you know, we do, definitely do have a focus on research oriented things. That being said, um, and ha having done a fair bit of, of drone flying over a lot of different kinds of animals. Um, the, a lot of the lessons learned are applicable. Um, you know, one of the things we're really interested in is avoiding 
observer effects. So how do we use drones in a way to observe animals without disturbing them? Because that's the goal, right? We don't want to observe what animals are doing because they're disturbed by a drone. We want to observe animals in their natural habitat doing the things that they normally do. Uh, and so, um, so there's a significant component of, of, of what we teach that allows you to do that um, and to, to be asking the right questions and thinking about those things before you get into the field and end up wasting a day doing something. So, um, so there's definitely a lot of crossover there. Uh, the one thing that we don't do is, is provide you know, more cinematography tips. We're really focused on, on imagery as a data source. Uh, and then sometimes that's very different than what you might be trying to do to get that perfect wildlife shot. Um, and so those are places where we would see some some deviation, um, and maybe Justin and Troy have, have you know some observations on that. Yeah, that sounds that's yeah, exactly what I was thinking. There's a lot of overlap, definitely, um, but yeah, we there's some deviation. <laughs> that's the mission objective. Agreed. Cool. And we have one um, other question. Can you give some examples of past projects by students and how they have applied their learning? Uh, it's a great question. When we ran the course last year, uh, we had learners from the Wildlife Conservation Society. We had learners from the Southeast and Caribbean Ocean Observing Network or research um, system and, um, and folks from NOAA the the uh, you know federal agency that's that manages fisheries and a lot of stuff in the ocean, and um, many of those people who went through the class are now applying those skills in the real world, uh, in their in their work in their actual employment environments. Um, we know that the folks in uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society have been working on missions on turtle arribadas down in South America. Uh, we know that. Um, that folks in NOAA are increasingly using drones in the coastal environment, um, and uh, and and a lot of the people that were part of that first cohort that came through are now out there live collecting data um, and collecting good data. And that Arabata, Arabata, I can't. Anyway, that's a mass nesting event, right? Like for the right. people that don't. Oh yeah, yeah. It's like situations where. Thousands of turtles all come ashore at the same time to nest. It's crazy. Awesome. And, and you know, I we're getting to the end of time, so um, we're going to wrap up. And I believe we've answered most of the major questions. But on one final note, um, just to make sure you no know, final like major questions get missed. Um, if you have one at the bottom of the chat, I want to ask. Someone was curious what drone do you all recommend? So I'm going to make that our final question unless we see another major one pop up. Oh, uh, can we, can we each have a go at that question? Sure. Okay. I'm going to, so clearly this is going to depend on context, but if you're just starting out, it's the cheapest drone that you can find because you're going to crash it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Troy, go. Well, my favorite drone to fly is a free fly Alta X, um, but it is not the most budget friendly, uh, being that if you strap just the batteries onto it, it takes two batteries to fly without any type of payload, you're already at like 40 pounds almost, or maybe even a little bit more than that. And you can only go up to 55 without a waiver under the FAA. So and it's $23,000. Um, but a small drone that you can actually use for something besides all the crazy flying things around, like this is my personal drone, DJI. Uh, they own a latest metric. I've seen like 85% of the, the drone market, and that's because they're great, reliable drones. Uh, and they are fairly budget friendly when you're speaking of drones of like thousand bucks or so U.S. I agree with all that. I would say like, it's hard for me to, to say one particular drone just because the mission objective that we have, whatever question we're asking really does dictate kind of what the best platform is. Um, Cause I much prefer like the EB for any sort of mapping of a large scale um, is, is a 
solid drone, but I love the versatility of just like a quadcopter. It's so nice. I can't choose just one. <laughs> <laughs> can I can I add one thing too that that that's maybe most importantly is that if you take our classes, you'll be able to actually choose what drone is best for those things. That's what we're going to teach you when you're look at what your mission requirements are. You're going to have the the knowledge and experience to be able to say for this, I want this particular type of aircraft. I want this particular type of sensor. And this is how I'm going to approach that data collection exercise. That's where we want you to be. And that's where we'll get you. Well, yeah. Stole my thunder, Dave. And I just got to get one more plug in for Hannah because she uh, has created these amazing uh, wine interactive games that allow you to go through and kind of create your own adventure you're familiar with like Oregon trail. It's built around that to reinforce what you learned from airspace uh, leads into some of what you're going to do with Justin. And then also covers what you learned with Dave, if you took the first course. So it's like all encompassing um, amazing, great interactive learning tools for you. Take the oh, course. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you everyone who attended um, for your attention today. And thank you to our panelists for taking the time to answer all these questions. Uh, we're out of time. So I'm going to hand it over to Laura. Um, thank you so much, Laura, for hosting and putting this all together. Thank you, everyone. Um, we will be sending out the recording to those of you who missed it um, or those of you who want to watch it again. And if you have more questions, uh, you will have our contact information. So we'll be happy to happy to chat further about the course or about drones questions that you might have. So we hope to see you in class soon. Um, and thank you again for, for coming and, and uh, look forward to staying in touch. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, Have thanks, everyone. Day or night. Take care. Bye.